Okay, so let's get started. We are in the book of Acts. Sheets are over there or somewhere. Okay. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 22. And let's read it together here. So Acts chapter 4, <coughs> chapter 4, verses 1 through 22, okay? Actually, let me read it all in the English Standard here, so we can be on the same page. Give me a second to turn to that. Okay, 1 through 22. And, and as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Look at that, 5,000. Okay, <clears throat> all right, number verse 5 there. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with uh, Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of a high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power, by what name do you do this? Uh, remember, they're referring to what? The healing of the person. Remember, so from a couple weeks ago, they were coming to the temple to pray, and there was a, a person, a beggar there, and they were healed. That beggar was healed in the name of Jesus. So they're inquiring of that event, okay? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God rose from, raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What should we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this time. So they called them and charged them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them, because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. All right, awesome. Uh, question, we didn't pray yet, did we? No. Okay, thank you. So I was reading that, I'm like, do we pray? So let's pray real quick, okay? Heavenly Father, bless us as we study your word, impart to us knowledge, understanding, and ultimately repentance and faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Yeah. All right, epic text. Very epic text. Let's just jump into our sheet right away, okay? Wait a minute. Yes. Uh, did you do your study and find out, find out why we didn't use a man at the Oh, yes, now? yes. All right, ditch time, right? Rabbit trap. Um, I did call. Um, I have a, now as a pastor, um, I over the years what happens, and this happens in all industries, right? You, you find different go-to guys, right? And uh, so if I have a question about like the history of the LCMS, I have a guy that I go to. If I have a question about like let's just say a Greek or Hebrew uh, term, I go to Pastor Byersdorf over at St. Mark's. He is he is a whiz of the languages, fluent in Hebrew and Greek, so I go to him. If I have a liturgy question, I go to my friend Sean Danzer, and Sean is now at the International Center, 
And so I called Sean the other day and said, I got a question for you. And I asked him, I said, why do we not have Amen at the end of it, all the hymns? And so, so I said, oh, he was really excited to think about that. So he went through, he had a bunch of hymnals in his office. And what, what he came up with was this, is that was kind of a cultural phenomenon in the early 1900s. And it was happening in the Anglican hymnal, I believe he said, um, our, our TLH, and a couple other hymnals during that time. But before that time, uh, that never, ever happened in any of the hymns. So it was just a cultural phenomenon that developed in the early 1900s in the church. And so <clears throat> one of the reasons why the, 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 the Lutheran study, or not the, the Lutheran hymn, the, the Burgundy hymnal that we have now, the reason why they omitted the amen is that a lot of the hymns have the word amen already in it. So it doesn't make sense to sing the hymn and say amen, and then what? Say amen again. Uh, the other thing is, too, is, is while this is true, Sean also said that while it's also true that a lot of our hymns are prayers, not all of them are what? Prayers. prayers. And so sometimes there's a, mi a misunderstanding that all of our hymns are prayers, but and if, if all the hymns were prayers, then it would be appropriate to say what? Amen. But many of the prayers, or many of the hymns are not prayers, they're confessions. Uh, many of the hymns are sermons. Okay? So he said that it was, to his understanding, it was just a cultural phenomenon of piety that happened in the early 1900s. And he said it was, what he could tell, he was pulling hymnals off of his shelf. And he's looking, he said, okay, he found it, I believe it was the Anglican, he found it in, in uh, our hymnal, and there was another hymnal, it was the Episcopal one he found it in. So he found it there, but then he looked before that, and in some of the old German hymnals, and they didn't have on them. And after that, they didn't have it. Yep. It wasn't a red hymnal, though. Yep, that's the, the TLH. Yes. Yep, TLH. Yep. That's what he's saying, is that... Okay. Yep, so he said that, that it just... It, he, he said it most likely was just a, a, a part of the piety of the church that developed. Okay. Um, and so it was resembled in that. But that piety of singing Amen at the end of the hymns isn't in hymns before that time. So the first time it really, you see it come about was the early 1900s. You know, and we have... Our whole church in South Dakota still uses the Amen, and when any of the members come here, they say, where's the Amen? Yeah. <laughs> it was so, so different to them. <laughs> so Sean, I asked Sean, um, sorry, I'm going to share a little bit more, so I'm going to buy it. <laughs> um, so Sean said, is it, is it wrong <clears throat> to do it? Absolutely not. So Sean was very clear. Absolutely not. Not wrong to do it. So does the Yep, yep, the Audi Opera. Is it, wrong, is it wrong not to do it? Absolutely not. So it's completely up to the piety of the church. So whose authority uh, was it to take it out? Well, that's the point, is, is what, what Sean said is the Lutheran Service book, the reason why they took it out is because it was not really in previous hymns before the, the Red Hymnal. So that was the first time that it appeared. But why don't they have the congregation about it see what they think instead of them taking up it yeah. um, like, 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 like yeah. you said, uh, there's a lot of hymns that uh, are prayers. Mm -hmm. You know, if they are prayers, they should have, uh, have the amen after it. Yeah. You know, I can understand that. Yeah. But uh, the authority that's going to come down and tell me to do this is like the government telling me to wear a seatbelt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so as far as... <clears throat> Just, just so you know, the Lutheran service. So, just for the record, just for the record. So, just for the record. So, Lutheran service book came out in what, two thousand six? Yeah, two thousand six. So, just for the record, when the Lutheran service book came out, the hymnal that does not have any amens. In 2006, I was doing contemporary worship at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so I had my flip-flop sandals and my khaki shorts, and I was pounding on a drum and the electric guitars. So, so what's that? And I had long hair. <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna need to see. We some need pictures. pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have seen it. So, 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 so you can't bring, you can't bring the contemporary worship guy. <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I, what I'm putting referencing is my previous denomination, you guys. Um, and, and I don't know, and again, I don't want to spend a lot of time making this about me, but I don't, I don't think the average person in our church here recognizes 
such a, the, the huge shift that Serenity and I took. So we were former uh, praise and worship leaders. So in other words, huh? Not very good ones. Not very good ones. <laughs> <laughs> so in Southern California, um, they had a glass pulpit, and I would preach in the glass pulpit with my uh, khakis and then flip-flop sandals and a polo shirt, and we had TV screens. This was before projectors. I mean, this is back in 2004. It's before really you had projectors and before you had flat screens. So we had big box TVs, right? You know, hanging from pillars in the church. And you'd come in and to the church. And as you would come into Victoria Community Church, uh, the volume was cranked up and the band was just roaring with noise. I mean, it was, it was, yeah. it was a concert. It was loud. And my favorite song, you remember, Serene? My favorite song was called The Happy Song. And I loved it. Because it made me actually really happy. The lyrics, I have no idea what the lyrics were. It's something about Jesus and happy. And I, just, I, just, I, and, and I shame to say this, but when I was when I was ordained in Southern California, I to the church, they said, What songs do you want? And I said, I want the happy song. <laughs> At my ordination. And, and so so we had the trap set, we had um, uh, one of our members was actually originally from Jamaica and he would play on the uh, Mongol drums or whatever they were, and then, and then we had electric guitar, and we had a guy named Steve, really wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people, so don't get me wrong, they were wonderful, neat people. Steve, he was a child of the 60s, uh, played in the bands, and he, he would just he would just let, it, let, let loose on that guitar. And that's, that's, that's what I came into the ministry ordained into. You and had the 20 minutes. Clapping and singing before church ever started, sort of? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, we would go, yep, so the band would start, and yep. the band would go for 15 minutes. Yep, and you sang and then, the 7-Eleven? And then, yep, and then I would come in, and I'd say, Hey, Victoria, church, Victoria, can you share us? What's up? And like, hey, and this is it. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and then, and then uh, yeah, did you say amen? No, I didn't. Amen, all woman. And so then, so then we would do that, and then when it came time for communion, we would pass the communion, and we had, you know, grape juice, and we had Hawaiian bread, and I just remember, you know, my theological conscience was, was fairly not as sensitive as it is now, but I remember kids grabbing big chunks of Hawaiian bread because they didn't eat breakfast to eat Hawaiian bread <laughs> during communion. And, uh, and then from there, yes, it's ready, and I were the, you know, from there we developed into praise and worship leaders, where I would preach at my other church, I'd preach, and then when I'd get done, I'd go and I'd sit on a cajon. Okay, let me explain to you what that means. Go sit on a cajon. A cajon is a box, and it has a snare on it, and you, and you hit it with your hands to play drums. And that was a drum. So I'd play the cajon, and then she'd play the guitar, and we would sing our songs. And uh, I only needed four chords. She only needed four chords, though. Yeah. And, uh, so that's what we came out of. So that's what we came out of, and we started to fall in love with the liturgy, and we started falling in love with the sacraments. And it started to wreak havoc on our worldview, and that's where I remember one day Serenity came to me and she said, "When are you going to come out of the closet?" <laughs> and I said, "What?" She goes, "You're a Missouri Synod pastor in a non-Missouri Synod church body," and it really dawned on me. We were installing our youth director. Uh, we had a youth director. We were installing them, and I was having to go through the installation vows. And as I was having to do it, it hit me that I no longer agreed with those vows. And that caused a what? A crisis in my conscience. And then I had to what? Look at how to, how to jump ship, if you will. Yeah. And so yeah. it cost us $20,000 to leave our previous denomination and join the Missouri Synod. We had to go to St. Louis to take a bunch of classes. We had to go through the ringer and interviews and all that, which I would say is good, right? Very, very good. It was a very good process. It was difficult, but very good. Yeah. So. Um, one thing that I think a lot of people who are not out in other churches don't understand is within the LCMS church, what you described is happening as well in some churches. I came and I was part of um, the praise worship band as well mm -hmm. at our former church many years ago now where I was teaching. And so it's not just not a denomination. This is happening within the LCMS church as well so you know we look at the forming of the the hymnal well we've got our two sets of lcms you know kind of at heads with one another so they're it's a big group trying to make it all work so let me just give you real quick but what do you think 
my disposition is when I see things from my previous denomination happening in our LCMS. Red flag. Uh, how does that make me feel? Okay. Very angry. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, you know, That's another thing enough. I yeah. see so much from previous denominations, they have their, their, their so-called leaders, people that stand up and lead studies and, you know, they write tons of books. And they get a really big head because all of a sudden they attract, I mean, they're like rock stars. They have their conferences and they attract thousands of people and it goes to their head and they fall like timber in the woods. I mean, you know, yeah. they just, they can't keep it together. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it, it never fails. Yeah. You said, okay, did you do the liturgy in your old church? No. So how did you learn the liturgy? So, so I didn't. So, so, so um, I remember going to, when I was in St. Louis, I knew I needed to have a shirt like this, and I went to the clergy, or went to a Catholic supply company down there, and they had, I, some of the guys I knew, they had the white tab that went all the way around it, and I'm like, that kind of looked cool, so I thought, let's do that, and I looked at it, and I didn't know how to put it on, so I got this one, because this one is easier to do, and I remember for the first time, um, I looking at it all. I put it all. I didn't know how to put it on. I didn't know how to tie. The, I called it the rope. Well, you know, where's the rope? Well, no, I'm so, no, it's not the rope. It's the cinch. Funny story. <laughs> Funny story. I was very, very new to the LCMS in winter, and I went with my buddy Sean Danzer. Now, Sean, I, I learned the liturgy. I learned the liturgy from Sean and from Joshua Reinke. So I was in Bodno for about five months, and Joshua Reinke taught me how to stand, where, how to hold your hands. I didn't know how to put an alb on. I didn't know where to stand. I didn't know how to, I, I knew none of that. So Josh Reinke and Sean Dancer taught me. And so everything I've learned on that, I've learned from them. But funny story, I don't know if I told, I don't think I've told you this before, but I went to an installation with Sean and up in Grand Forks. So I swung by to pick Sean up, and we went on up. And we got up in Grand Forks, it was brand new, it was the LCMS, and I really didn't know what installations were about. And I get there, and we're all in the sacristy, which I didn't know what that word meant since I learned what the sacristy was. We're in there, and I'm with all these other pastors and very, you know, qualified, and, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like this. And they're, 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 they're taking their albs, and a lot of them have routines. They, one of them takes the, the, the stole, that big thing takes the stole and prays a prayer and kisses the stole and puts it on. And here is me, I put my alb on that day, and I got my head stuck in the arm. <laughs> so also I put it on, and then all of a sudden, because I was nervous, and I was just trying, because we were a little bit late when we got there, I put it on, I got my head stuck in my arm, like and, 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 and I'm, and I'm borderline with, you know, seeing bad words, because I'm like, like I'm, I'm, oh my God, so I'm stuck, and then from that get out, and my hair is all pulled up, and, and, and I pull it up, and then, and then I, had a, I had one my one ball that has a hood, and I put it on, and I got my head kind of stuck, and I looked like I was in the Ku Klux Klan. And, and so, so the, one of the, the head dudes from Minnesota was there, I, I, I don't know if it was their Mr. President or not, older gentleman, he comes over, he sees me, goes, here, here, let me help you. And he comes over, he puts, this, he puts it on, and, and my hair's sticking up all over the place. And I'm like, oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> and I look around, and I look over at my buddy Sean, and he's over there kissing his soul. And <laughs> 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 so, I'm not thinking that up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, so, so it, you know, so like when, when you guys said to me, like, where's the amen at the end of the hymnal, I, no idea, I, I've never, never heard of that, you know, I, I don't know anything beyond the food and serves. Now, I do know, now, so how do I, I have to, you have to learn the ancient liturgy, so I've, I've learned the liturgy from the 1500s, how they did it, and I've learned the liturgy from the first, you know, three centuries, I've learned that, but the, the, the culture of the Missouri Senate, you know, um, I, I was with a pastor a while back, and we were visiting with lunch, and he was like, well, you know this person. I'm like, no. Well, this person, this person, this person, no. This person, and I finally looked at the pastor, and he said, just so you know, um, I'm a theological mutt. I don't, I, don't, I don't know all these names. 
I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're very, very prestigious, important people, but I don't know them. Mm -hmm. You know, and and, and, and but I, I'd be happy to learn. You know, so. Makes sense. Yeah. I have a question for Swimsy. <laughs> How did you know that he was more Missouri Synod? Um. Well, as far as theology goes, I had also done a lot of studying in seminary at the same time that my husband did. Um, and I, not being in the role of pastor, was able to do a lot more digging uh, freely without any ramifications. So as far as the Book of Concord, as far as the historical liturgy, things like that, I was able to dig way deeper than he was because he was still in a preaching role, he was in a teaching role, in the Lutheran Brethren and had certain uh, boundaries where I didn't. I could, I could do that, that CP on my own. And so watching him and, and just listening to his speech and how he was being affected by the different books that we were reading, yeah. um, I was able to say, you know what, this you're actually down here when you think you're here, and okay. you're gonna get in big trouble <laughs> if we keep doing this. So to be able to just encourage him to say, hey, let's, why don't you take some courses, why don't you go for your doctorate, and then you're able to have your feeding from the Missouri Synod, and just, we can make that transition slowly. So, so just so you guys know the doctorate, I wanted to quit it. Um, the only reason why I did the doctorate was if I didn't have the doctorate from the Missouri Senate and I approached them, you know what the Missouri Senate, they would have done this right, Missouri Senate would have said, no, nope, you don't know enough about Missouri Senate, you got to go to St. Louis for a year to study. So I knew that. So the reason why I did my doctorate was when I came to Missouri Senate, I could say, hey, guess what, I'm three quarters done with the doctorate from your seminary, so please don't have me have to quit work and I'll work with my family, go down to St. Louis, go to the seminary, and then I don't know if I have enough money to do that. I don't know if we can do that. So when I came to them, I said, I have, you know, I have 75% of my doctor done from your seminary, and I've been going to Winkles with uh, Montana, with Montana preaching to all of the LCMS guys. I was going to their events. And so then I was able to bring that, and I said, oh, okay, so you, you've you been getting to know the Missouri Senate, and I knew the theology, but the practical side, that's what I didn't, you know, yeah. I didn't know the practical <laughs> side. Um, <laughs> Is, is your pastor good? Is your pastor good? Your pastor good? Yeah, he is. I didn't know. I didn't know the practical side. I mean, I knew the theology, yeah. but I didn't know the practical. Because it was more of a. I mean, was, we're, we're talking a, a span of at least two years. Two years of transitioning, which was really tough because we 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 didn't know how it was all, it was going to all play out and what the thing was going to be if we would even have. A position when he was done, so we were very much taking a big risk with our family. Yeah. Did you stay preaching until you went back to uh, St. Louis? You guys, you guys, okay, talking about this? This fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <coughs> if not, then. I don't know else knows, but it's uh, <laughs> so I resigned in March of 2013. No, I didn't. I talked to my district president in March of 2013. I said, I'm going to be leaving. And I asked, I said, can I please stay till May of 2013 until I go to school down in St. Louis in June? They had to call the, the, the synodical president of my previous denomination, the top guy. He gave me a special blessing. And I told him, I said, I'm not interested in taking this, my, my previous denomination, taking that church into the Missouri Senate. I'm not going to start a war. I'm going to be very respectful. And I said, I'm going to be very kind. And so I was very kind. They were very kind to me. And so my previous denomination, they were very, very gracious, very nice to me, very respectful. So I, I, I commend them for that. And then so May came along. I finished up my last Sunday in my previous church in Montana. Then we packed up our minivan. We rented an efficiency apartment uh, in Clayton, uh, Missouri, which is right next to St. Louis. We, we went down there, uh, it was Matthias on the surrounding night in our minivan, and it was a fully furnished apartment, and the kids were there, and it was really a fun time for them, and I went, I went to classes from 7.45 till 3 o'clock, and I was doing my doctoral classes and all of also classes in order to be certified to serve in the Missouri Senate. So that was Monday through Friday, 7.45 till 3.30, and then the evenings I would study till about 10, 11 o'clock every night, and I did that for a month straight. Then after a month, then I had all my classes done, and I had most of my, doc uh, most of my doctoral classes done, 
Then we moved in July back to my mom and dad's basement. In July and August, I wrote my dissertation. So I'd wake up in the morning about eight, nine o'clock, and I'd write my dissertation about five or six. So it took me two months to write my dissertation. August came along, I got certified, which is great, but then you have to wait for what? A call. A call, a call wasn't coming. So August went by, no call. September was coming, no call. We started school, living on my mom and dad's basement. Uh, our paycheck, we don't have a paycheck, so we're, you know, financially we're struggling. So I got a job at Walmart, and they offered me the produce section or the meat section. I took the meat section, they said, why? I said, meat sounds more manly. <laughs> and I was really excited because I thought I'm gonna get a knife and I'm gonna get bloody, and I came and I found that it was all packed and I just had to what, put it on the shelf. And so, um, then well, during that time, I was going to church in Bodno, Joshua Reinke, got to be good friends with him. I showed up one Sunday and he goes, uh, we're gonna make you a vicar. I said, what's a vicar? He goes, I'll explain it later. <laughs> <laughs> so I stood up in front of them and I became the vicar. And then afterwards, and this was President Bonnick before President Birch, and I said, well, does, does President Bonnick know about this? He goes, oh, I'll call him this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so then they put me in as a vicar, which was basically what, what Caleb is doing, right? So as you guys see with Caleb, so it's the exact same thing that I did in Bonnick. And I did that for three months until I got a phone call to go to where? To Winter. Yep. And the way it worked out in Winter is one of their elders was having phone conversations with another gal in Botno. They were both widows and just kind of they were just kind of seeing how things went. And that's what I did through kind of a little bit of a love interest. Then all of a sudden I got my name on list in Winter because of that. Yeah. Yeah. But at least you were close to Bobcat if you needed work. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of times I feel I feel kind of cheated. I don't have this rich heritage of our LCMS. I was raised Baptist, but yet in a way, it's a blessing because I saw all of that. My mom told me our kids were not gonna to go to heaven because they were baptized as infants. And then I had to fall in and find out why do we baptize infants. Yep. It made me dig deeper to see why do we believe this. Yep. So if you're raised in it, you probably don't question or study as deeply as somebody that's been Yep. I mean, I've been there. I've been to these rock concerts. I've heard praise bands. I've stood 20 minutes and clapped. I know it. That's the way. <laughs> it's like coming home when you come here. Okay. Uh, oh. The only thing I was going to say, when we went to the new hymnals, I was in Illinois, and I, it was mostly all old people. So they had a lean on We used the old hymnal one Sunday, then we used the new yeah, back and forth. Really yeah. The old hymnals. So the question was about some of the books. I didn't write the books until I was in the Missouri Senate. Yeah, so the books were are published by CPH. So um, there's been yeah, two, two, and then there's a third one coming up, and I'm done until kids are out of the house. So those were done by CPH. But the one that the real Jesus, please stand up, that was really written from a context of understanding the false Christ that I learned all the way growing up. So comparing those from with what I've understood now. Yeah. My, my dissertation was on becoming Lutheran. So I, I studied, I wanted to study about 40 to 50 people who became Lutheran uh, from evangelical churches. And I sent out the surveys, I had over 400 res survey response. I was only expecting about 50, I got over 400 responses. So I studied the journey from uh, like Baptist and Nazarene churches into Lutheran church. What happened to them with their emotions? What happened to them with their friends? What was going on in their head? Uh, what happened to the way they viewed the Christian faith, what happened to the sources of what they read and, and their theology. So it's, it's studied over 400 people as they, they journeyed from Nazarene Baptist churches, Pentecostal churches, into the Missouri Synod, which was what? That's what happened to me. Yeah. But I want, and I knew what happened to me, but I want to, you know, to have data to explain it. And let me just tell you this, there is a fundamental theological difference a huge theological difference from what we're doing here on Sundays and what we see 
um, down at maybe a Baptist church. We're yeah. using the same words, but the theology is completely diametrically different. They do. Christ has not. That's and kind and of I would even argue that in some of these churches, when you say Jesus, they have a completely different view of Jesus than what we would see in the scriptures and the creeds. Yeah? My mom was Lutheran Brethren, okay. and my dad was Roman Catholic. Okay. So when I was going to the church at Our Saviors in Bottnell, they started attending because mom wanted to what, support her son. Then when I left to go to winter, I thought my mom was going to go back to Lutheran Brethren, my dad would go to the Roman Catholic. And then I got a phone call, and they said, um, Matt, we want to let you know, um, after over 70 years of going to separate churches, we're both decided to join Our Saviors. And they joined the Missouri Senate. So they had, they had membership classes, and my mom's watching, so I'm going to hear, well, she'll call me here. <laughs> <laughs> I called Pastor Ranky, and they did a membership class. And, and uh, there's different ways to do membership. So he did a membership class with him, and he called me up. He's like, we're going on the 14th week, or whatever it was. Because I said, 14 weeks? He goes, yeah, your mom keeps on asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> And so they both joined the Missouri Synod up there, and so I, got, I took a Sunday off, came back, and, and preached the day that they were both uh, accepted as members. Wow. And my sister, too. Yeah. Yeah, so it's pretty That's neat. That's awesome. Well, look at the time. <laughs> let's do this. <clears throat> let's, take, let's take eight minutes to dip our toe into this text, and then we'll save the sheep for next week. Is that okay? Okay. All right. All right, so... Peter and John, they were arrested that day. But for what? Well, the religious leaders and the temple police would have said that they were disturbing the public. However, in reality, they were arrested to prevent them from speaking. Yeah, interesting. We must keep in mind that Acts chapter 4 takes place when the, within the context of the lame beggar being healed. From the context, everyone was going to the temple to pray. Now, so just imagine, everybody's going to the temple to pray, right? But the lame man, he was begging, and what happened? They healed him, which brought forth a crowd. Now, if you imagine going every single Sunday, let's just imagine <clears throat> every Sunday you came to St. Paul's here. Now, this doesn't happen here because of the weather, you know, it's too cold, but imagine coming here every single Sunday, and as you come here, right on the end of the street corner is a guy who's lame and who's crippled. And every single Sunday you drop maybe what? A five dollar bill for him. Every Sunday, so that's part of your, you get used to that, that routine. Then all of a sudden, that you pull up in the parking lot, and you see him, and he's dancing a jig. You'd say what? W would you come into church here? No, you, you, you'd, be, you'd be so sidetracked. What happened? He is what? He's, he's here. You know, you know, pastor, sorry, your Bible's still going to I'm going to have to go what? Figure this out. I want to know. So, so what happened? They drew a crowd. <clears throat> so they drew a crowd, and then amid the crowd, Peter started what? He started preaching. And then what happened? They most likely miss the temple evening sacrifice, okay? Ask any preacher, and they can tell when Christians are skipping church and talking in the church kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 uh, Diane and Amanda, and Diane, on Wednesday during Advent, uh, meals and Lent meals, uh, well, what will happen is, 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 is they'll look up and say, Pastor, sorry, we uh, missed uh, Vespers. We were cleaning up in the kitchen. Now, I, I don't blame them. I get that. And, and I, was, I always say, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm like, I what? I don't. <laughs> right? uh, just picking on you guys. But, but, but <clears throat> what happened? They, 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 they realized there was a crowd outside checking out this healing. And the religious leaders, they, they probably looked at them like, you know, uh, where's Johnny? He's always standing right there. And where's Susie? She's, where are they at? And then, and then after the service, they come out and they see them out what? Yapping in the parking lot, right? Okay? Around, and then all of a sudden, they see, they see Scotty, who's been the, the beggar now. He's, he's jumping around and, look at my new legs. And he's you know, just, just like all wiry and excited, right? You, you imagine this. So, long story short, the religious leaders, along with temple security, okay, so there's temple security. So keep in mind, uh, like we have a security task force here, right? 
um, they would have temple security during that day. So the, the religious leaders and the temple security, they came out, okay, they came out, uh, uh, came out to the group where Peter was preaching, and what they heard from Peter was diametrically opposed to what the Sadducees believed and taught. So they come out and they hear Peter, Peter preaching and talking, and what they're talking about is what? Different from what they are officially saying in the temple. Okay, namely what? Namely the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees did not accept the what? The doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. So what's going to happen to the Sadducees? Number one, you skip church. Number two, we're hearing you say something that what? We do not sanctify as what? Being right. So what's going to happen? Immediately what's going to happen to the religious leaders, they're going to be threatened. Right? They're threatened why? There was something that happened that was so powerful that kept them from coming to hear us speak, and now what we're hearing they're speaking about is different than what we're saying, and all of a sudden the crowd is more attracted to them than us, then they're what? Threatened. Okay? Okay, so Peter was talking about Jesus and the resurrection, something the Sadducees disagreed with. Thus the religious leaders had Peter and John arrested for, get this, what they were teaching. Now, you would impress them back in that time. So why are you impressing them? They would probably say, oh, they're disturbing the crowd, right? Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, majority of the time, the issue is never what? The issue. The issue is never the issue. The reason why is, 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 is what we do is we always try to hide our true actions when we're doing something unjust. And we always try to spin it to the positive. So if you would ask them back then, why are they arrested? Oh, because they were disturbing the crowd. They were, they were, they were, they were you know, kind of, you know, they maybe didn't have a zoning petition for this, 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 this religious assembly. They would come up with some bogus idea like that. But in reality, they were upset with what was what being taught and spoken. Keep in mind that for persecution to occur, and for a person to be classified as a martyr, it must be over what the gospel what is being said and taught. For example, several years ago, a church was shut down and prevented from meeting by a local city council. Persecution, martyrdom, right? Nope. What was not properly told in this story was that the church was meeting at a person's home in a residential area, and the church had grown so large that parking became a very big hazard. Residential streets are not made for consistent parking on a weekly basis with 30 plus cars. And so the city council's objection to the church was not over the what? The, what? the gospel, <clears throat> but over the church not following proper zoning procedures, having a church in a residential building, and violating city parking mandates. Okay, so what we look at is with Peter and John, okay, they were being persecuted and they were being shut down and arrested for what they were saying. So that would be properly speaking persecution. Now my point is this, is many times Christians will claim that they're being persecuted when in reality they're what? They're not, okay? In this case of this church that was being shut down, I read the whole story, this has been, this has been five, six years ago. The reason why they were shut down is that people on Sunday morning, they couldn't even get out of their driveways because there were so many cars parked on the street. Now, I would actually argue that those people can go to the driveways, they probably shouldn't have church in the first place, but nonetheless, there is a right to have the freedom to what? Move it out of your driveway. Uh, fire hydrants need to be what? Not covered up by cars in the case of fire. You should be able to drive through a street. When the streets were so clogged up by this church meeting in the home, the city got involved and they what? Told them they couldn't meet there. Then the Christians at that church, they immediately went to what? Persecution, persecution, persecution. When in reality, no, it wasn't persecution. That makes sense? Okay? So true persecution has to be over what is being spoken and said. Okay? Now, I'm going to let you, I'm going to finish this paragraph and I'll let you launch on this to think about it. Or perhaps another very dis, uh, important distinction. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, was he a martyr? Okay? Now, I'm going to acknowledge this is pretty controversial what I'm saying here, okay? But I want you to think about it. <clears throat> Technically, Bonhoeffer was not hung for the preaching of the gospel, but for plotting Hitler's assassination attempt, okay? This does not diminish the importance of what Bonhoeffer attempted to accomplish by any means. 
However, pointing out the distinction is important with respect to understanding persecution. Just because a Christian is punished by a governing entity or a more powerful force does not automatically mean they are being persecuted. That makes sense? So, I would actually argue that Bonhoeffer was hung for, now I, I would say that he was, he was in the right for, for, for trying to go down this road of what? Taking care of Hitler. So don't get me wrong, I'm not, not saying that. But his hanging was not due to him preaching in the pulpit. It was due for his plot of an assassination. Okay? That makes sense? So that's a big debate that people are going to have for the next you know, 50 years. Was Bonhoeffer technically a martyr or not? Okay? So my point is what we're going to come back and we will pick this up next week is with, with Peter and John, they are technically being persecuted because they are being what? Challenged and told to shut up with respect to the gospel. That makes sense? With respect to the gospel. So when the gospel is being um, muzzled, that is persecution. Okay? So that brings up a whole question, and, and, and we'll hit this next week, but you think about this. What happens in certain, um, certain cities and certain uh, places in America when they're not allowed to preach and teach with church services? I have a friend in Southern California, and they've been having church this whole time. You know how they do it? They meet outside, and they have a divine service outside. And you know what he said? It's been a blast. It's been wonderful. And they all come, they spread out, and they have church. And so he is not saying that he's being persecuted. However, there are circumstances where they're not even allowed to meet where? Outside in parking lots. So, so is there persecution going on right now, this year, with respect to COVID? I would say there are some cases where indeed it is. And other times it's not, and we're saying it is. Okay? So we're gonna, we'll pick that up next week, and we're going to we'll expound on... Um, uh, Peter and John, and, and talking about how they reacted and uh, this arrest and what they said and how they responded to the governing authorities. Okay? All right? Okay. Before we go, you said you wrote two books. What's your other book? Um, so, the Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? And then another one was just called Words of Strength, and I wrote like six six parts of it. It's, it's a bunch of pastors that wrote it. So, that just was released this week. It's for youth. Words of Strength, um, that was for, it just came out this week. And then the other one is, is going to be later this year. It's called Minute Messages. I think that's the title. I don't know what they're going to come up with the title. It's the devotional booklet that will be coming out. I don't know when it's coming out. This summer, maybe? So I'm going to meet with them on Monday on Zoom. We'll figure it out. So, yeah. Sounds good. Thanks, you guys. Um, let's pray. Okay. Let's stand. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all of my doings in life may please you. For in your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Thanks, guys. Last chance for race for some park. This is Peggy Brock, though. You know, there's, there's Missouri Senate churches that are.